This is Star Talk. This is a Things You Thought You Knew edition, and that means it's just going to be me and Chuck for this yep. whole episode. Can you can you handle it, Chuck? No. <laughs> I'm already. I'm overwhelmed. Because uh, 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 I already know that I don't know. See? Uh, oh, oh, okay. There's no thinking. There's no thinking that I know. Okay, so but. we're going to... Uh, let's first take on the topic that's so simple. Why do things break when they fall? What do you think of that? See, but this is... This is what I've learned yeah. from things you thought you knew. <laughs> there are times when in the past, at full disclosure, where you have said, so we're going to talk about floating, things that float. And in my head, I will say, not audibly, of course, uh, <laughs> but I will say, Neil has lost his damn mind. <laughs> He wants to sit here and waste people's time talking about why something might float. And I'm like, why, well, right, bro, whatever. Let's, okay, let's get into it. And then we start talking about it. And by the time it's over, I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So, well, so here you go. Here we let's, go. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Why things break when they fall. Yeah. So, uh, maybe it's obvious to some people, but just I thought I would tease out the physics of what's going on. Okay? All right. Okay. So, you have a plate that is up on a shelf. Okay. Right? It's a breakable plate. All right. And somebody shoves the plate, it falls, it hits the ground and breaks. It's a cat. A cat did that. A cat did that, for sure. It's for, always a cat. For sure. Right. Okay. One of my favorite memes, was it a meme, where they said, we know the earth isn't flat because otherwise cats would have pushed everything off of it by now. <laughs> I, that I was, never saw that, but that that's was good. hilarious. That's a really good that's evidence good, yes. that earth is not flat. All right. So the plate is in front of you. You actually have to commit some kind of violence on the plate to do it. Okay. okay? So what you have to do is ask how much energy is holding this plate together. Okay. All right. So you go down to the molecular level and see how strongly the molecules are bound, are bound to each other. Mm. Okay. So in a crystal, for example, they're pretty strongly bound together. So if you try to break a crystal, it's hard. It takes more energy to right. break a crystal. All right. And so, but a fragile sort of dinner plate, all right, not a plastic plate, but just one that can break. You actually have to put energy into it and the plate will not break unless the energy you put into it is greater than the binding energy of the molecules holding the plate together. Okay. Okay. That, well, and that makes sense. That's simple. Doesn't that make sense? It yes. makes complete what, sense. What, yeah, I, but, what, what, what doesn't make sense right now is yeah. binding energy. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I thought those two words mean exactly what you think they mean in that sentence. So the two molecules that are adjacent to each other Mm -hmm. Right now, why doesn't the plate just separate all by itself? All by itself. Yeah, something is holding the molecules together. Mm -hmm. Okay, it could be any one of a number of kinds of forces doing it, but nonetheless, they're attached to each other. And if you introduce energy that's greater than the energy that's holding it together, you will break that bond. Gotcha. Okay, so that's how anything breaks, basically. Right. But yeah. we're happy yeah. to use dinner plates for this example. Mm -hmm. All right. So if it's just sitting there in front of you, and if you pound on it, you'll break it. All right. So you had to put energy in it. But wait a minute. The plate that's sitting on a shelf that the cat pushed off, you're not pounding on it. You didn't pound on the plate. Mm -hmm. Nothing touched that plate. Okay. Did the cat break the plate? No. The cat just showed the plate the edge of the shelf. And even if the cat broke the plate, you know cats. They'd have been like, I ain't break your plate. <laughs> I don't even know who you're looking at. Why are you even looking over here? First of all, why are you in my house right now? That's, That's what I'm trying to figure out. Who the hell are you? And why do you like, why do you show up every day? How'd you get a key? Is what I want to know. How did you get a key to this house? <laughs> well, can I get back to breaking plates, please? Anyway, anyway, okay. so the cat didn't do anything to the plate. The cat didn't physically break the plate. 
Right. Okay. So what broke the plate? This is the question. You know that if you take a hammer and hit it to a plate, it'll break. You know if you pound your fist on the plate, it'll break. You'd know all this, okay? Why did the plate break when it fell off the shelf? Because it hit the floor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, yes, yes, okay. Uh, okay. Um, it hit the floor with a certain amount of energy. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And the higher the location it falls from, the more energy it's going to have. Does that make sense? Uh, of course, yeah. And you know what kind of energy that is? Uh, energy of motion. So we have a word for that. Okay. Kinetic. Kinetic energy. Exactly. So the kinetic energy of the plate that it had the instant before it hit the floor, mm -hmm. you have to ask, how much energy is that compared to the binding energy of the plate? Okay. Uh -huh. All right. right and right, right. so does that exceed the binding energy of the plate? And if it does, the plate will break. Okay. Where did the plate get its kinetic energy from? Um, gravity. Gravity. Okay. Uh, all right. But gravity didn't put the plate on the shelf. Okay. Who put the plate on the shelf? Well, I mean, I mean, who who lives with the cat? <laughs> <laughs> That's who put the plate on the shelf. Yeah, because you know. <laughs> okay, so so the plate used to be at a low location, right? And somebody walked up to the plate after it was cleaned. It was like the lower shelf of the dishwasher. They picked it up, used their energy. Uh -huh. to give that plate what's called gravitational potential energy, okay? Mm -hmm. And the higher you put the plate on the shelf, the more gravitational potential energy it has. Uh -huh. And then the plate just sits there in possession of gravitational potential energy. It just sits there. And if you dare, if the cat pushes the plate off the shelf, the gravitational potential energy swaps and becomes kinetic energy. Right. Okay? Until it has no gravitational potential energy left, which is right when it hits the floor, and all that energy becomes kinetic. Mm -hmm. And this dance between kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy is what goes on in every curve and every turn of a roller coaster. Okay. Uh -huh. Other than the first pull up the top. Right. Okay. Where there's like chains and motors, everything else is free fall. Basically, you're in free glide. All right. And so that's why when you go up a hill, you slow down. Well, why are you slowing down? Because the gravitational potential energy is taking away your kinetic energy. And, and once you get to the top, why do you speed up on the way down? Because the kinetic energy is taking away, is, is, is being converted from the gravitational potential energy. And your fastest point on an entire roller coaster is going to be where? The fastest point? Yes. You mean where you reach your top speed? Yes. Where's that going to be? Uh, the bottom of the first drop. The bottom of it, the lowest point of the roller coaster right. is going to be your highest kinetic energy. And your, and your, and your, Highest potential energy is obvious now. It's going to be whatever is the highest point on the roller coaster. Right. So the roller coasters fully exploit this gravity, kinetic energy, potential energy relationship. Okay? And mm -hmm. all I'm saying is you want to know who broke the plate? You did because you gave it the energy to break in the first place by ascending it to that shelf. See, it sounds to me like you've been talking to the cat. Because <laughs> that's something the cat would say. <laughs> I had nothing to do with this. Hey, what you talking about? <laughs> Whoever put, I don't the, know. <laughs> put it here, it's their fault. All right. I was just introducing you to some gravitational kinetic energy, okay? <laughs> Getting rid of some potential energy. And by the way, the broom is over there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. Okay. Now, suppose the plate fell from an even higher height. Okay. All right. It, it just doesn't break into two. What happens? Oh, it shatters. It shatters. Egg, unless there's some other sort of structural 
aspect of it, like like safety glass shatters rather than just breaks into large pieces. That you know why it's called safety glass because the pieces are are so small that one piece can't go in and like cut your jugular. Right, you'll just be like surface damage to your skin uh, with safety glass. That's why it breaks into very small pieces like instantly. It's so. It, what? So it's death by a thousand shards. <laughs> instead of one. Instead that, of just that, one big one that cuts you in half. That put, put, pierces your aorta. All I'm saying is that if it's higher, it gains more kinetic energy because you gave it more gravitational potential energy. And by the time it hits the ground, it has much more energy to, bake the, to break the plate with. So it doesn't just break it in three places. It'll break it in a hundred places. There right. it is. Nice. So. That's why things break when they fall. I have to say, once again, I'm impressed. <laughs> Gotta tell you right now, <laughs> uh, you know, I thought at the end of this talk that I was gonna feel like the cat. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> wait, wait. So, and, and just to be clear, you could make something. If you wanted to say, I wanna make a plate that doesn't break. Right. All right. So you make sure the binding energy between the molecules of the plate is greater than the energy that would that it would be given by the cat if it fell off a very high shelf in your home. And so it's basically unbreakable for most things that would happen in your home. And so you could ca you could calculate what that energy is and find a material substance for which that's the case. So that's where you get break resistant. So I was going to say yeah. So, so break oh, I, resistant stemware for clumsy wine drinkers. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the the material, substance of it, has higher resistance to, it requires more energy to break it than what is normal and typical for a delicate wine stem. I had a job where I had to uh, demonstrate something that was uh, <clears throat> billed as unbreakable at the time. Mm -hmm. And when you're, you were supposed to demonstrate it within reason, okay? I took it and slammed it down and it exploded. And I then said to the people, uh, maybe it is break resistant. <laughs> <laughs> and that was your first and last day on that job, right? Oh, oh, oh without a doubt. Are you kidding me? All right, so there you go, Chuck. Listen, here's the one thing I know now. The earth is not flat. <laughs> that's Thank you. <laughs> if that's all, okay, that's, if that's your only takeaway, that's a start. That's a start. <laughs> all right, we'll be right back. Chuck, ready for another one? Oh, yes. Okay, this is the topic of white noise. You know... <laughs> no, no, don't go there. Just, just stop. I'm just <laughs> saying... <laughs> Chuck. Since since January 6th, now that we bought it up. <laughs> no, I did not bring it up. Now that we bought it up, I got it's just, you know, since January 6th has happened. <laughs> while, while we're on the subject. <laughs> White noise. Right. <laughs> was long defined before the chaos at the Capitol. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, white noise is what is described as a combination of sound frequencies that ends up just sounding like a, like a hiss. It, it's a hiss, okay? Right. And so what's going on there? As, as opposed to black noise, <laughs> which is, <laughs> shut them damn kids up! That's black noise. <laughs> Y'all know I'm down here trying to watch my stories? <laughs> the hell is wrong with you? That is black noise. Black noise. That is black okay. noise. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> we'll introduce that to the annals of physics. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Like enough I said, sil <laughs> enough silliness. <laughs> so, uh, so here it is. So what it is, it's a mixture of all frequencies of sound. Oh, wow. All, all at once. Okay. All audible frequencies of sound. Okay. okay. You could add in others, but it won't make any difference because you can't hear them. Okay, so white noise is low frequency, middle frequency, high frequency. And there are different ways you can do it because high frequency sound at the same amplitude actually carries more energy. So you, you might sort of 
adjust it so that you have the same amount of energy, uh, sound energy in each sort of frequency band. All right. Okay. So there are different ways to define it. The point I'm making is all sam all frequencies of sound are are sampled, and what that sounds like to you is a hiss. It's like okay. Hiss. Okay, right. so they say which, the air. Un it's so unfortunate now that we live in an age of digital streaming and cable television, because kids will never get to know what white noise sounds like on their oh, the, television. The when set. you're between channels, when t when, when TVs were were actually grabbing uh, radio frequencies from the air, yes. right, with the, with the antennas, <laughs> right. If you were between channels, or if the channel went off the air, you would see static on the screen and that would sound, that would be the sound of white noise. Yes. Oh, oh by the way, by the way, by, by the way, uh, some fraction, a few percent of the hiss that is on that screen uh -huh. is the cosmic microwave background. Oh, that's hot. As opposed to the world where Carol Ann was taken in Poltergeist. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I'm not authorized to speak further on places such as that. <laughs> so, so, so that's what it would look like if you made a sort of image on a screen. But that would be, oh, by the way, that would be electromagnetic noise. Ooh. So that's not audio. Yes, that's... they turned a radio signal into an acoustic signal. Right. And that acoustic signal comes across as a hiss, as yeah. a white noise. All right? That's so, so cool. That's so cool. Just to be clear about that. So right. now you have to ask, why is it called white? So here's where it comes from. If uh, Isaac Newton, uh, one day, uh, the sun is shining through his window mm -hmm. and he closes his curtains or, or he cuts a hole in the wall. I forgot which, he might have done both. And just one narrow beam of sunlight comes through the wall. Okay. okay. Then he takes a prism, a 60-60-60 equilateral prism. Okay. okay. And he puts the sunlight through the prism, and on the other side of the prism comes the rainbow. Right. The colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Okay. But he had a mystical fascination with the number seven, and those six colors don't sum to seven. So he added one. Mm -hmm. which, which color did he add? Indigo? Indigo, of course. So we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo. Violet, all right? Mm -hmm. And that spells everybody's friend, Roy G. Biv, okay? Mm -hmm. We all love Roy G. Biv. Uh, all right. Yes. So there almost, are his- Almost as much as Bell Biv DeVoe. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Bell Biv DeVoe only knew. Oh, no, <laughs> Had a cousin called Roy G. Biv. If only they knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, Anyhow, so it, it has all the colors there, okay? Right. So the question is, did the prism create these colors? Because the white light is no longer visible. Right. And this is what everyone presumed. Of course it created the colors. Because if they were there before it entered the prism, the prism, you would see them. We see them. Of course. So, so then he said, well, what will happen if I take another prism Put these colors back through. Let's see what then comes out the other side. And you know what came out the other side? White light. And uh, so Newton was very clever, not just because he was smart, but clever in his experiments and what questions to ask and how to adjust the experiment to test for things where you, it could be one thing or another, but let's readjust the test to distinguish what explanation might account for it. Oh. In so doing, he showed that white light from the sun is composed of equal amounts of all the colors in the rainbow, in the spectrum. And by the way, rainbows, people said, oh, the raindrops are making the colors, not the sun. It's right. in the sunlight. This is freaky. How could color be in white light? What the hell is going on? Okay, well, you gotta get into the physiology of the retina and the brain and all of that. The point is... Your eyes are racist. <laughs> that <laughs> is how all the white, all the light is white. <laughs> all the colors come in to your racist eyes and all they see is white. 
I'm afraid I have to just say that is the physics of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's the physics of it. So the, the point is, if you combine all those frequencies of light, the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the violet, and combine them all, and you have equal amounts of them all, you get white. Uh-huh. So this word in that context was then borrowed by the sound people. Uh -huh. If you put equal frequencies of sound, okay, it's not a thing, it's just this noise, mm -hmm. we shall call it white noise. Even though the sound, unless you're synesthetic, where you have cross-wired senses, the sound is not a color, all right? But we assign, we say it's white out of homage to Newton and the colors of the spectrum and the fact that you put all of these colors, these different frequencies together and you get the color white. So that hiss is white noise for that reason. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because it is, I, I understand the, 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 the borrowing of the term, that makes sense be, just because it's the same picture of what yeah, you yeah, Plus you're using frequencies. You're using you're frequencies, using frequencies, you know, frequencies right. right. So sound right. waves, light waves, the whole deal, frequencies. Exactly. So that all makes sense. But the, 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 the term doesn't really fit for, for like you say, unless you're, uh, you know, uh, you have synesthesia. It doesn't right. fit. We it, need it, a better term for white noise is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the point is noise can be any combination of those frequencies. But when it's equal across the board, mm -hmm. the, only then is it white noise. That's No, why can't it be equality noise? <laughs> okay. <laughs> DEI noise, diversity, equity, that, inclusion. There you go. Diversity, equity, and inclusive noise. that's what it's doing. That's De it's including DEI. everybody. And we can call it day. Day noise. De DEI noise. Day. Right now, there are, let me tell you something. Right now, there are some Fox News viewers that are watching us right now, and their heads are exploding. <laughs> their heads are exploding right now. No. Bill Maher just threw up. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's, he's anti woke. That's oh yes, he's yeah, so yeah. anti woke. But yeah, yeah. yeah. no, so, it makes perfect sense, honestly, to to borrow that uh, that picture. But it's of, a very of, specific of, kind of noise. It really it's, is. It's, otherwise, it's not white noise. For example, if you had more red in your spectrum than blue and right. you mix them together the object will have a red hue to it right. okay yeah. and if you have more uh, blue in the mixture rather than red it would have a blue hue to yeah, it that's... in fact red stars and blue stars in the sky are exactly that they're giving you all frequencies but they lean towards those the, the that side of the spectrum that has those colors so um, I, I think it's okay to borrow terms yeah. that make sense in other contexts. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, it, it paints the picture. I mean, uh, you know, from yeah. the new, the problem is not too many people know the Newton story. That's my point. Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. It it, it, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Once you, once you explain the Newton story, I'm like, oh my God, that, that's awesome. You know, it, it, I, like I get it now. White right. noise. And, and if your acoustic noise is clank, clankety clanking, or, or if you can find any signal within that noise, it's not white noise. It's not white, right, exactly. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's very cool though. Okay, I, like so I thought I just set the record straight there. Yeah. Jeff? Once again, I'm impressed <laughs> that you took, you know, something totally stupid. <laughs> <laughs> made it made it super interesting <laughs> and and informative. I got, I'm gonna tell you something. I don't know how many times you can pull this trick. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I, I don't want to hear later on that you come out with a with an album, uh, Black Noise. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that should be my next album. Black, Black Noise. noise. That is good. It. That's good. That's a good that, name for an album. That's all that I'm could saying. work. That mm -hmm. could work. Black Noise. Black you, Noise. You heard a white noise? Here's yeah. some Black Noise. There you go. Shut the hell up. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Don't make me put my foot up your ass. There you go. That's more Black Noise. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right, we gotta end. And by that. the way, let me what? just say this: what, what, black noise and white noise make perfect sense together. Okay, 
It's just like, what the hell is going on? What? How many times I'm gonna tell you? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, shut the hell up. <laughs> Black and white dogs. They belong together. They belong together. (laughs) Oh, man. So, Chuck, you ready for another segment? Absolutely. Okay, so let's take a quick break. And when we come back, the third and final segment of Things You Thought You Knew. We're back. Star Talk. Things You Thought You Knew edition. These are fun, Chuck. I like, I like doing these. Love it. I, I, mean, I, mean, I, I prefer having a guest because I don't like being the center of anything, but mm. I'd rather showcase the expertise of others. But there's these dangling holes in, in all of what people know and think is going on in the universe, and, and I just got to patch them up. I like it. I think it's more fun when it's just us. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like guests too, but, you know, this is nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm lazy, and I'd rather like the guests. I mean, the guests do all the work, right? Because it's their expertise we're tapping. Right. But but there there are certain things in the world that uh, are incomplete in people's awareness of how things work, and so. Well, that's the fun of this is yeah, that yeah. it it goes to a place where you would not logically progress. Yeah, exactly. There's no step right before to say, "Let me go there." Yeah, right. Because exactly. there's, there's too many lanes and routes and off ramps around it. Okay. And so and we'll just put, we'll stand right in the middle of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Okay, so here it is. A topic, things to do with wormholes. Uh-oh. <laughs> Watch out. I just thought, you know. I don't know, I, man. I don't know if we should be doing this. People are not imaginative enough. That's my I've point. Why are we wormholes. going to- why are we giving people... Let me explain. No, scientific um, sci-fi writers right now are watching this here. Yes. And going, bro, get a pen. <laughs> yes. Neil Do deGrasse it. Tyson is about to hook us up <laughs> Do with it. some killer ideas do on it. what to do with wormholes. Do it. My point is, we should be getting paid for this. <laughs> we, this is valuable. <laughs> All right, so here it goes. Uh, so let me remind people what a wormhole is. Yes. All right, so we have the sort of the fabric of the space-time continuum. Mm-hmm. All right, so it's not just that space is out there. Space is int- intricately configured with time. And how do you know this? Because we, uh, we did this exercise before. I think we yes. did space-time in, a, in, in, we another, did this explainer. in another show. We did an explainer yeah. on that where I ask you, uh, I say, Chuck, let's have lunch. Um, let's have lunch tomorrow. Okay. Right. Let's have lunch tomorrow at 12 noon. Okay. And, and then, of course, I will say, are you buying? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's that's no, not what course, I thought. To, I would, of course. Okay. The, of course. It's, well, where, where do you want to have lunch? Well, yeah, like, yeah, you know. yeah. So the question is where? All right. So I set up a time and you knew that was incomplete. Right. And we have to complete the the engagement by establishing a location. Right. So I gave you a time, tomorrow, 12 noon, and you're going to say, where? All right. And I might say, you pick, whatever, but we need a where. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. All right. I could be in a place at a different time or at the same time at a different place, but we have to be in the same place and the same time in order to meet. Okay? Right. And uh, on, on the same token, I can say, oh, I'll meet you at Gabriel's for lunch. Okay, and then you say, what time? All right, Uh, so space time are forever conjoined for this fact, okay? Mm -hmm. And and other reasons, but this is that's the that's the terrestrial one that is closest to how we think about the world. All right, this fabric can be distorted in such a way that you can change the distance the space-time distance between two locations. Okay. All right? And one way to imagine that is, imagine all of our universe is just on a flat sheet of paper, Mm -hmm. and you're on one edge of the paper, and I want to get to the other edge, and I'll take light years of time, whatever, however long that takes, 
okay? Right. I mean, it's light years distant, so I take many years traveling at the speed of light. But if I take the space and warp it, curve it back on itself, mm -hmm. now your location is very close to me. If I could somehow punch through the fabric of space and time and reach your location. That's the warp drive right there. Yeah, well, well, so the warp drive would accomplish that by other means, right. but it is nonetheless warping the fabric it's of space. Warping this fabric of space. Making right. something that would otherwise be longer a shorter distance and thereby transcending the speed of light to do so. You're no longer limited by the speed of light. The diameter of our galaxy is 100,000 light years. You can't travel across it unless you figure it, during the TV commercial, unless you figure out a way to warp space and time. Okay, so in that warp, in principle, on paper, you can have a hole that you pass through and just come out the other side. And you're in another place. And if you did it right, you can show up at another time. But let's just make your timeline continuous with yourself. So you go right through and you come out the other side. Bada bing, there you are. That's the most classical invocation of a wormhole. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by the way, in spite of what Hollywood shows, that when you go through wormholes, it's like you go through the the water slide at the water park. No, that's not how, it's just, you just step through. Right. And you're there, right? right. This is accurately captured in, in Doctor Strange, all right, where he opens a, a portal. I don't, does he, do they call them wormholes? In, no, in they DC don't, Con? they call them portals. <laughs> yeah, just a portal, and that's a wormhole. And, but in Rick and Morty, they do exactly the same thing, and he know, they're wormholes, they, they know this, okay? And the difference, of course, is that in Rick and Morty, they're using real science to make their wormholes, whereas Doctor Strange is using magic. Magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you gotta, you gotta, you know, do your fingers in a way and right, go exactly. in a circle, right. and, and, and the little sp sparklies on the edge of it too. Yeah. Right, right, right. And there's definitely uh, weird-looking ideograms that they, yeah, somehow, <laughs> okay. somehow have power. And, uh. Okay, so, so things to do with wormholes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, you can move through space and time, just as has been portrayed in the film. But let's get a little more practical. Yeah, okay. Right. So uh, the movie Monsters, Inc. was all about wormholes. Did you see Monsters, Inc.? You have kids. You saw Monsters, Inc.? I did. Several times I've seen that. Okay. Movie. The doors. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. They're manufacturing doors That's that the right. monsters take home, and then they open the door. That is the door of the closet of the kid they have to scare that night. That's right. Okay, and there's a big chase scene where they're going in and out of doors in the factory, and they show up in Paris, and they show up in, in you know, in 20 different places with every door they pass through. Those are wormholes. So instead of a transporter, which molecularly decomposes- I'm getting there! You are exactly oh. right! You yeah. Chuck, that's my next thing. So my point is, if you just walk through a door, you walk through a door. Right. Okay, that's the wormhole. And while they never said it in Monsters, Inc., which is a Pixar, Disney, Pixar animated feature, very cleverly done, and, it's, and they're funny. Um, they didn't say it, but those are wormholes, period. Period, right. okay? Right. Without the, the histrionics of a, of a Doctor Strange and without the madness of Rick and Morty, they're wormholes, okay? Well, if you have wormholes and you can warp space in that way, then the transporter in Star Trek, which dematerializes you, beams your energy at the speed of light to a location, and then you get rematerialized, right. would be completely unnecessary. Doesn't know, exactly. You yeah. just pop the hatch, walk through, and now you're in the other spaceship. Now why you're on the you, planetary surface. Why'd you have to take me apart? <laughs> exactly. You completely <laughs> took me apart, bro. Completely. Yeah. Okay, plus uh, there was some episode I was told maybe in the later series, because I'm less complete in the later series, that there's some fraction of your molecules that are not transported Reconstituted, accurately. yeah. Yeah, there's well, like an well, er that's, copying errors. Yeah, that's, well, that's why they have the uh, buffer. It's called the transporter buffer system. Because of that, it compensates for that, which is why sometimes, which is so lazy, but it, I love it. it, it works. It's like somebody gets lost, and they're just like, well, what we'll do is we'll use the transporter buffer to take all of their molecular imprint, and then we'll just make them the, make bring the person back. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So they don't they don't really die in a pile of goo, right? From, right? Okay, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So so what's interesting there is 
we're in the age of information, which was not so in the 1960s. Right. And so they weren't thinking about information in the same way or at all. And so all you really need to do is make an exact copy of all the information that is contained within you, all the neurosynaptic configurations and everything, and then beam the information to another ship and then recreate you there. And then what that means is I can create you in any location and I can create multiple yous. That's right. right? And I mean, why not? They do that with the, with the replicator. All right? That's right. That's uh, all the replicator does. That's it, all it does. It, yeah. So in principle, if you have a replicator, you don't need a transporter system. Okay, we just have the information of who you are and transport that. But so that's one thing you would do with a wormhole. Okay, so we have monster scaring children. That's the first application. That's Second, I love it. Because otherwise, how they, otherwise, how are they going to get in your in, in the kids' room? There's no way they can get in. Exactly. Another thing is, imagine if the back of your refrigerator were connected to your grocer. Oh wow. He'd stock it the same way he stocks the shelves at the grocery at store. The, at the grocery store. They'd take a peek. Oh, you're low on lettuce. And the lettuce is turning bad. They'll take out the lettuce, put in a fresh one. And there is no transportation network involved. Mm, say goodbye, Grubhub. The, 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 and yeah, so Grubhub is, is, a, is a practical wormhole, right? By the way, you know what else a wormhole is? Another is an elevator. Ooh, Think yes. about it. You walk into a room, the door closes, and then when the door reopens, you're in a completely yeah. different time and place. That's actually kind of you know you know yes that. Think about that. Yeah. Just, if, if you if before electricity and before elevators and before tall buildings, just grab someone off the street. And take them into a modern elevator. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. Yeah, and then the would. doors, you know, they, they're on a street level or something. And then they push a button and then they open it up and then they're a hundred stories up and they'll freak out. How did that happen? The room didn't change. I didn't see anything. There are no windows. What happened? So uh, for me, an elevator is a modern sort of next best thing to a wormhole that you can come up with. Yeah. As, right? As, you could be in one room and then take an elevator and then there's a kitchen. And another room, and then it's a, like a living room or whatever, yeah. you know? And, and so just the world changes just in a matter of seconds. So uh, so what do we have? So we have the elevator is a poor man's <laughs> wormhole. Yeah. We've got scaring children in their closet. We've got the transporter in Star Trek. We've got the back of your refrigerator. And what that ends up doing is completely removing the transportation sector from the world. I was going to say, what you really do, I'm home for the rest of my life. <laughs> I don't have to do anything. <laughs> By the well, way, if, yeah. you don't have to go somewhere to obtain something. Yeah, everything could come right through the hole. Right through the hole. Correct, correct. Uh, and I got one other, I think I've told this many times, but I, I even laugh every time I retell it, even though it happened to me and it's my, my joke, right? So is, is that good or bad, Chuck? Are you allowed to laugh at your own? I listen. I, I say whatever works for for the person for, telling the for joke. Whoever. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So so here I was in the Charlotte airport. I was and I had to go from a big plane to a little plane. And the carry-on that I had did not have wheels. So I actually actually had to carry it. And I Chuck, it felt like I walked three miles. It might have just been a mile, but to go from a big plane to a little plane in that airport, I must have walked the full width of the entire airport campus. Right. And I finally get to my destination with the little bitty ass plane. And I said, I got to tweet this. So I tweeted, can't wait until there's, can't wait for wormholes. That way all airport gates would be adjacent to each other. <laughs> you just, you just step through and you're there. Right. Okay. And then, cause I thought that was a nice geeky thing to, you know, tweeting to my geek base. I got out geeked. Okay, I got out geeked. Here it is. Uh, one of the responses was, Dr. Tyson, the day we have wormholes, you won't need airports. <laughs> I said, oh. That is true. Oh, yes. Oh, oh. Yeah, but, well, you, now you just put every pilot out of work. I know. Well, this is a readjustment to the economy. Yeah. That's happened many times before. Nobody's making horse-drawn carriages anymore or buggy whips or, you know, there's whole industries that don't well, exist. I, I, I don't. 
they're still making the buggy whips. They're just not for buggies anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> they're just called whips. Okay, yes. fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. Um, so, so basically the entire transportation sector would go out of business basically overnight. And it's wow. a fascinating reality. And, but, and plus, you wouldn't need 12-lane highways. To go anywhere, right. you go. Yeah. You want to go grandma's house for Thanksgiving? Yeah. Just wormhole in. So, so each home would have like a general purpose wormhole right. that you dial the coordinates and come through. But your right. grocer, they'd only have access to your refrigerator, right? Right. And and, and your and, in-laws would have access to your friend's house. <laughs> do, do not come in here, man. That, I'm going to tell you something. I don't like the world with just wormholes. That's a little too. No, close. you could lock them. We'll figure out a way to lock them. It'd be you're like your front door. Okay. Yeah. You, you hear a knock. You know. The, no, but you can never get away from anybody. Think about it. No matter where you are, you lock them out of your wormhole. Yeah, but then they then they call you on your worm phone. And they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, "I'm right here." Yeah, I'm, I'm right here. Hey, man, what's going on, man? Where are you? I just went to your house. You're not home. <laughs> right? No, I'm in I'm in Bermuda. Okay, I'll meet you there. Uh, exactly. Oh yeah, you're Bermuda. That's great. I've been in you know in a couple seconds. No, man, this is not cool. You know? uh, okay, I didn't think of the downsides of this plan. Yeah, right. Okay. So, uh, somebody's got to like think it through a little further than I have, but uh, just think, or, or maybe the wormholes are where the previous uh, ports were. Right. You had, you, you know, uh, train stations, airports, spaceports. You right. have a wormhole port. And so you can't just go anywhere at any time. You got to sort of sign up and. Yeah, that's a little better. Yeah. The other way's a little invasive. You can't even pretend invasive. like back in the day when like, you know, that, you know, people would, Knock on your door and be like, "Oh, you know, okay, we're not answering that." Yeah, in the day, you <laughs> you couldn't tell them in advance that you were showing up, right? right. So you had to be ready to greet someone. Bet that's at right. The door. Somebody... In fact, the very word "caller" was someone who knocked on your front door, and that word was adopted into telephones. And so now we think of "caller" as only with phones, right? But the, you know, the gentleman caller for on the lady. You I know, do believe you have a gentleman <laughs> caller at the door. <laughs> My good Delilah, <laughs> you did not tell us. <laughs> you got your plantation accent right on, right on cue exactly. there. Okay, so Chuck, that's 101 things to do with a wormhole. That's lovely. I love it. I thought I'd tell you about that. And uh, so let's call it quits there. That's been the third of three segments of Things You Thought You Knew. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed that. That was fun. And as always, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson bidding you to keep looking up. <laughs>